My name is Christina Merrill, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation. And I beat the often path by stepping out of my comfort zone and doing better for cancer patients and putting that mission first. Welcome back to the Beat the Oven Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase a wide range of different success stories to radically expand our idea of what's possible with our one life on this earth. Joining me today is Christina Merrill, president and CEO of the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation. For the last 30 years, Christina has dedicated her life to improving health outcomes and quality of life for transplant and cancer patients. Her foundation has helped more than 100,000 patients and their families. They specialize in people with a cancer diagnosis or those in need of a transplant, and they provide financial assistance, educational information, and emotional support programs at no cost. She's committed herself to a truly noble cause, so I'm honored to have her on the show today. Here is Christina Merrill of the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation. Well, welcome to the show, Christina. I'm so glad to have you here. How are you today? Great, thank you. Happy well, guess what? Here. We've got an interesting task ahead of us in this episode because this is a light and fun and entertaining show, so we're going to make cancer light and fun and entertaining. Go. Okay. No, I'm just well, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a fun one. But no, go ahead. Tell us about what your mission is. Well, the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation, I founded it 30 years ago. And I saw a gap in the healthcare system and thought I'm going to raise funds for cancer patients and provide support and resources and everything to kind of supplement the medical care that they were receiving. And that was 30 years ago, and we are the little engine that could because we are at every cancer center around the United States, providing much needed support to children and adults and their families, and have had some great work and connections with incredible patients, as well as great uh, supporters and funders of our cause. Well, that sounds wonderful. And I'm sure that the climate has changed significantly since you first began this mission. What was the gap that you noticed then, and how have things changed since then? So health insurance covers, you know, hopefully the medical care, the the treatment, the surgeries, the chemotherapy, but often not the housing, transportation, um, co-pays, um, all the costs that are associated with treatment that we often don't think about. We don't think about the cost of somebody having to take a leave of absence from their job and not get an income or having to maintain two homes, one um, near a cancer center so that they can get state-of-the-art treatment or, um, you know, uplifting their family and having their other children or other family members stay in one home and then supporting another home. And, you know, just all those costs associated with treatment and trying to save your own life or your spouse's life or a child's life. And, um, and it's overwhelming and people don't know what is ahead of them. So their whole lives have been uprooted and turned upside down. And now they're faced with having to Um, try to, you know, come back to to life again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And these gaps, to what extent would you say this is an American problem and a global problem? I'm sure at this point you've seen enough of the international market to know. Yes, well, um, our healthcare system is obviously very different than internationally. And, um, you know, everything is either self-pay or you have to have very good health insurance to um, get the treatment that you need. And a lot of people can't afford all the costs involved and they can't afford a health insurance to begin with. So you have people that are on um, different types of um, public health care and that often doesn't cover certain cancer treatments or where you wanna go for treatment. Um, so it's, it's an issue in our healthcare system. And 
Um, the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation fills the gap by providing financial assistance programs as well as we also find patients and we help uh, to better health care um, services and treatments and we navigate for them and give them information that they need. That sounds great. So how much of a gap would you say is there between the best health insurance and estate health insurance or God forbid somebody who has no health insurance at all? What is the range there? Well, it most of the time patients can get lucky and they can find a provider that's in their health care um, insurance and do okay. So, you know, it's not all, um, you know, doom and gloom. But often, you know, you want to go to a specialist that might not be in your health care system and your, for your insurance. And that's often an issue for families. And, you know, often families fight um, insurance companies and try to get to the best care. So here you have a diagnosis, a life-threatening diagnosis, and now you're, you're fighting for your life, but now you also have to fight health care insurance companies and, and try to get the treatment that you know that you are um, needing and deserving of. And so it's, it's a problem. But our health care system um, is, you know, in general, it's great, and we're very lucky to be able to go to doctors that we want to go to, and get into them fairly quickly, where internationally, often you have to wait months and months to get treatment um, or months for a diagnosis. So it's um, that kind of socialized medicine is, is hard to not be able to get right into a doctor when you know that you're sick or you need to start treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I should start this episode by saying that I'm pretty intimately familiar with the ups and downs of this, as I imagine most people in this world are. I lost my stepdad to cancer at the beginning of this year after a long mm -hmm. battle. So I'm pretty familiar with what, uh, with you know, it, it is what it is. You know, it's, I think almost everybody at this point knows somebody or has been affected. It's pretty much ubiquitous. So I'm well aware of, of what the challenges are. And I think he did have good health care, but you end up in this situation really quickly where people who shuffle money around are asked to decide how much is a human life worth? How much should we spend on trying to keep any individual alive? How many millions of dollars is it worth? At what age has somebody lived enough? Should we try as hard to save a 99-year-old person as we do a 14-year-old? We're faced with so many tough decisions, especially when it comes to money and expensive things like treatment. How do you feel about that? Well, you want to have, have everybody have, um, you know, a equal footing to the healthcare system. And that's just not the way it is because often, you know, you also have connections and that's kind of the way it is in life in general, right? If you know somebody in a higher place, you can, you know, get a leg up in certain areas of life. And that's similar to, unfortunately, to the healthcare system as well, that, you know, if you know certain people, you can navigate yourself into um, maybe a better treatment option or a doctor that you really want to see that you can't get in on your own. And um, so it's kind of the way of life and it's difficult. And at the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation, we really help navigate patients so that they can see um, certain specialists that might be challenging to try to get to on their own, you know, just through the fact that we've been in this community for 30 years. Um, we are experts in navigating patients to different treatment centers and helping them um, have the communication skills that they need to talk to their doctors and so forth because it's intimidating for a patient um, to often speak to their health care providers or a new specialist. And so we try to help families get to those folks as well as to communicate with them. So cool. Well, at this point, you have, I'm sure, a lot of data You've seen a lot of cases. You've dealt with a lot of people, I have no doubt. Are we able to quantify the difference 
in life expectancy, somebody who has access to good treatment for somebody who doesn't, do we have a, any kind of generalization on outcomes that we can say at this point? No, I mean, I think that a lot of um, doctors, um, you know, I'm speaking from a social work perspective, not medical in terms of not a physician, um, but I think a lot of um, doctors will feel that a patient, you know, let's say you want to go to the state of the art treatment center that is across the country from yourself um, and your family. Um, I know that many doctors really believe that patients staying closer to home, you know, if they can get all the state of the art and treatment, you know, you don't necessarily need to, um, you know, relocate often because um, outcomes and health outcomes, all that, it, it has an impact for the family to stay together. And so you often don't want to break everybody apart um, if you don't have to, you know. So that's why we as an organization, you know, if the whole family can move together for six months or a year or however long the treatment is, it's better to kind of keep everybody together to have that emotional um, support system and not be an individual patient that's, you know, going to now be on their own and isolated and not have that um, that support system. So I know that health outcomes and all that is not just the medical care and the treatment that you're getting, but it's the whole person. And that's where we really focus on the whole person. And, um, and all of our programs are really focused on that. I love that. I think that's such a wise thing. And it makes so much sense to me. It's not just a medicine or a magic pill or a treatment. It's the entire mm -hmm. experience that matters. And again, yes. I have seen that firsthand. I know how important that stuff is, the intangible stuff. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of people may be affected by these things. They may be bothered by these things, but very few people make it their life's work to do something about these things. So what was it that pushed you over the edge to say, not only do I see these gaps, but I'm the person to do something about it, to take this giant thing on because it is a giant thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I've always been somewhat of a caregiver over the years. So that's my nature to begin with. And so it was a natural progression for me to be a social worker. And when I was working in the healthcare system as a social worker in the hospitals and with cancer patients, um, you know, it was frustrating for me to see these families come to um, a medical center for treatment and Yes, they were getting the great state-of-the-art treatment for their child or their spouse or themselves, but they didn't have all the ancillary support that they needed. You know, even just in those days, this is 30-plus years ago, when we didn't have cell phones, really. So we, you know, you had to, you know, put um, pay for a phone to be put in your room, in a hospital room, or put the television on. We didn't have iPads and, you know, Netflix and, you know, all of that sort of thing. So you had to put the television on to have the, whatever, 12 channels or 8 channels. <clears throat> and so patients didn't even have money to do that. They didn't have money to pay $15 a day for the telephone or $10 a day for the television, um, let alone transportation to the hospital uplifting their family to come with them, having their spouse or their the parent take a leave of absence from work so they could be with the child every single day and not leave their hospital room. Um, you know, pay, keep the electricity on at home or pay for a mortgage or pay for their co-payments for health care um, or just being able to have three meals a day while they were at this medical center. So all these aspects of care were completely not being a focus of support and really can in cause such incredible stress for a family, more so often than the disease. Like that was being handled by the doctors and they knew they were in good hands, but all these other issues, they were lost. So I thought I'm going to solve this problem and raise funding for patients and help them um, learn about this unfamiliar territory that, that they have now embarked on. So true. 
And we talked earlier about the difference between socialized medicine countries and America. And of course, they look on the United States and they're shocked by the fact that somebody can spend 15 minutes in a hospital. They get one ibuprofen and they're charged a thousand dollars for that. Here's a pill. It's a thousand bucks, ten thousand dollars. Just yeah. absurd numbers that have no relation to the actual world. I think it's interesting that you mentioned food because one of the things that I've noticed, you can be in an elite hospital, the food is always terrible. How is it that there's such a disconnect when a good meal would be $50? I can charge you $10,000 for a pill, but I'm going to put coffee, black, instant coffee in a styrofoam cup in a hospital? How is there no awareness of what food is or what healthy things are in a place that is supposed to be the center of health. Okay. Why is there such a disconnect? Well, I think that that <clears throat> is slowly changing. Um, I really do in terms of patience and a focus on the importance of nutrition. So 30 years ago, they were feeding children in a cancer clinic, uh, you know, McDonald's chicken nuggets. And the kids were taking this, eating this greasy food and then you know, basically vomiting while they were having chemotherapy. It was pretty eye-opening experience to watch this. And I think now we're 30 years later, you know, that's not happening anymore. And every major cancer center in the United States have somewhat of an integrative department that they're really trying to embrace and focus on for the whole person. So that would include nutrition and you know, acupuncture and meditation and visualization and massage therapy and lots of different support to the whole person. Um, so I think that that has gotten better. I mean, maybe the amenities when you step into a hospital and you're waiting for a doctor's appointment or in clinic, you know, they're going to have the styrofoam cup and they're going to give you black coffee and they're going to give you whatever. But um, the other aspects, I think, are slowly over the years have gotten better and more advanced and they're they're realizing that this is something they have to focus on I, I sure hope so because I just recently visited a friend in the hospital at a nice facility it wasn't for cancer just for something else but mm -hmm. in his room steamed carrots microwave rice just the yeah. most terrible meal you can think of and it's like if I'm gonna die I don't want that to be my last meal it's, how can we not just put an extra 35 bucks in the budget if you're going to charge an insurance company $1 million for 24 hours, why not just charge them $1 million and 35 and make the food good? Put some yeah. actual local produce um, in there. Yeah. I mean, it is, uh, it's an issue and, and, um, you know, hopefully this is going to start to be resolved, but yeah, it's not something that they're focusing on, you know, but it is part of, let's say patient satisfaction so the more that patients complain about it, maybe they'll be heard, but maybe, you know, so people are so focused on the fact that these doctors are saving their lives that they most often they don't care, you know, what the food tastes like. Even so nutrition is so important to our health and well-being and strength and all, all of that. But, you know, it's just not the priority. Yeah. And there's also such a disconnect between the holistic approach or this hippie approach, you've got somebody like Steve Jobs who has cancer and he says, I'm not going to get treated at all. I'm just going to drink juice every meal. And of course, he dies potentially earlier than he might have if he had gone the more yeah. traditional route. So we've got this, we've got holistic, like you said, meditation, yoga, all of that stuff on one side, eating a better diet, whole foods, plant-based diet. On the other side, you've got advances in modern medicine, advances in technology, and there seems to be very little merging of those two worlds. And I yes. find that to be very interesting that we can develop these machines that can do incredible things. And there, there's no doubt that there are advances in both drugs and technology to treat this every single day. But it's just fascinating that there's so little overlap between those two worlds. And you'd think at this point in time, shouldn't we know that there are relational benefits between these things? Can we really believe that diet doesn't matter at all it's not important to the treatment yeah I, I I've seen advances um, towards that direction with 
uh, certain doctors and medical care facilities where they really find that the nutritional piece and all of that is, is impactful and important. Um, you know, it's a slow process to get kind of on that bandwagon of really this is important and we have to focus on it as an integrative piece to our whole treatment for the person. Because obviously it's really important to have the traditional medical care and the medicines and the surgery and all the um, immunotherapies and, and all the different new um, you know, medical technologies and, and advances that we're having. But at the same time, we need that integrative piece that's so important to patients and to their families. And I think that you know, it's up to the patient to educate themselves and to learn about this so that they can um, be an advocate for themselves when they're talking to their doctors about this. Because doctors um, in medical and educational, um, you know, they're, they're maybe not getting such, maybe they're getting one or two courses on this. They're not getting an entire curriculum on new integrative care and all of that. So I think it's challenging and, and I think patients need to advocate for themselves and, and learn the importance of this. Yeah. I try and to, I try to educate our patients to all of this and give yeah. them the resources so that they can get the nutrition and work with nutritionists that are experts in cancer and cancer research and that have done the clinical trials on these, you know, um, supplements and, and plant-based diets and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think you mentioned that the support network is so important and there are obviously many people in this world who don't have that, who don't have a family, who don't have mm -hmm. these types of resources. And you have to believe that morale, just the general term of morale, is important in these situations. Anything that makes you feel like you're cared for, anything that makes you feel like people, that you matter, yeah. is important. And if you're in a room by yourself and it's sterile and cold and the food that you're eating is bland and subpar and you don't have anybody around you helping you along the way, that just it almost adds insult to injury. It would be much harder to fight as hard as you can, I think, in such an environment. Yes. Well, that's, um, it's really difficult for, uh, for individual people that don't have that support system. And cancer, even if you do have that support system, cancer is such a lonely experience. And um, so, you know, we all kind of felt that a little bit of what a cancer patient experiences when we've all gone through COVID and had to be isolated and um, really isolated from all of our friends and family often. And, um, and it was difficult. And imagine that that's what a cancer patient feels all the time when they are going through treatment and by themselves because they've been uprooted from their their communities or their friends and their families and their normal existence. And now they are um, in this new um, you know, way of life that they are so unfamiliar with and they don't have all their friends and family or anybody around them to help keep them positive and so forth. And that's where you know, we really try to become an extension of whatever we can do for that family. And one of our programs, which um, we just launched, which is called Cancer Buddy, and it's um, new technology in the, can in the cancer community, and it connects patients to patients and survivors to survivors and caregivers to caregivers, and it's an app um, and super easy to use, and it connects people on their diagnosis, their um, treatment, their, what hospital they're at, um, side effects, um, but also on who they are as a human being. Do they like animals or yoga or running or movies or concerts or what kind of music do they like? And it um, shows photographs of the person. They can upload photographs and give a little journal about themselves. So it really connects the person not just on their diagnosis or cancer, but on who they are as a human being and who they want to try to make um, part of their new buddy system and new connections and a new community of friends that can really help lift them and support them through the process. That sounds like such a great idea. 
How has the reaction been to it so far? Have people appreciated well, it? We just landed in the Apple Store on okay. um, last month. So wow. it's just been about six weeks. And we first started out with somewhat of a smaller cohort of our network and um, to get our Apple um, to get our app out in the in the world. And um, so we've gotten incredible response from patients um, so far. And um, I feel like it's going to be, you know, it's really, there's 19 million survivors in America and there's almost 2 million newly diagnosed patients every year. So there's big capacity for this sort of technology and functionality to be able to have an app connect you either down the hall from somebody in your own hospital that you would never have met because of HIPAA regulations. Um, so nurses, doctors, social workers can't connect you and share information. But you could jump on Cancer Buddy and you can find your people, find your buddies um, to help you get through life and during your cancer treatment. And there's so much studies on peer support and how beneficial it is for health outcomes and positive attitude and um, and just a feeling of hope and all of that. So it's really going to be powerful. Well, on your website, it mentions that you rely on private donations and you've talked about fundraising here. So when you began the process and you're thinking about building an organization that's going to rely on donations, was fundraising something that you had done before? Was this new to you? How did you begin this thing? What was day one like? Well, I was strictly a social worker, and all my training was social work. And I had not a clue about fundraising or running an organization at the time, and I was in my um, early 20s. And um, so I just was determined and had the vision to create this organization, and I knew what the mission was. So really, everything fell into place from there. And I was lucky, personally, in that my father was um, a jazz pianist and composer, and he did the first two concerts for me for fundraising. So I got the seed money through the help of family and friends, really. And that's how I started the organization, was just family and friends. And that's usually how a lot of kind of organization start early on. Um, And it wasn't personal in terms of everybody always say to me, you know, did you have cancer in your family? And, you know, knock wood, no, I just saw a need and wanted to um, help these, this, these people. That's even better. Again, to have the empathy to do that when it wasn't something that personally affected you is pretty remarkable. I, I applaud that. That's great. Yeah. So do you, do you think that somebody out there, because I suspect, and again, knowing this from my own mom and other people, there are people who do encounter this and they they say, I want to do something. I want to be involved. I want to make this a bigger part of my life. I want to volunteer. In your mind, if there are other people out there who think, I want to start a foundation or I want to do something like what you've done, Do you think that there is room for those people to do that? Is that a good thing? Or would you advise at this point them to just join forces with some larger organization? What do you think the best path forward is for somebody who has a similar idea to you? Well, I think that they should do their homework and see what other organizations are out there. Often with us, I have other funds set up within the organization from Uh, patients that have either lost a loved one and want to give back or patients that have done really well and they want to give back. So um, they'll come to me and to the foundation and there's an opportunity for them to start a fund within the Bone Marrow and Cancer Foundation. And since we are so well established at all the cancer centers around the United States and we have our patient coordinators and social workers and patient navigators that we are able to um, take that fund and be able to then distribute that funding to patients in need. And so um, 
I would suggest for them to, you know, do their homework, see what organizations are out there and see if there is a like minded organization that they really feel could really help them um, pursue their goals and their mission. And um, that's kind of the way I would go. And before starting your own 501c3 and trying to because it takes a lot of infrastructure, you know, to distribute the funding and make sure that the funding is going into the right hands of those patients. And it, so it takes a lot of administrative work. So I would suggest that. That's a great point. All valid stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure there have been moments where there have been big breaks or things that went your way or where you leveled up overnight, something changed I noticed on your website, again, that you have an endorsement from Evan Handler, actor Mm -hmm. made famous by Californication, among other roles, as the lovable agent of Hank Moody. Have Mm -hmm. those types of celebrity endorsements moved the needle? Has that been important for the mission? Has there been anything Mm -hmm. big that's changed the trajectory? Well, Evan has been wonderful, and he had leukemia many years ago. And I met him when he was doing a one-man show called Time on Fire in New York City. And it was so impactful. And I stayed, you know, outside the stage door to see if I could meet him. And I met him. And then we became friends. And he became a board member. So he's been involved for many years. And he's done some PSAs for us. And... He's written some letters, you know, obviously over the years for me to get other celebrities. And, um, and he's been, you know, a great supporter and um, champion of the cause. And he's helping with Cancer Buddy. He's an ambassador for Cancer Buddy um, to get that out there to the community as well for people to get onto the app. And, um, and I've met some incredible people. I've met um, John Batiste, who just won all these Grammys. Oh, for, Grammy Awards, yeah. Um, and he's done fundraisers for us. Um, his wife um, is a good friend, and she has had cancer. And um, so I, met, I got to meet John through her, and, um, and he's an incredible, incredible, um, talented person and compassionate and sweet and and thoughtful such a thoughtful thinker and everything about him and um i've met some incredible um ethan um zahn he was one of um the first survivors that won and he is amazing and he's an ambassador to cancer buddy for me and so i've met some really incredibly um thoughtful supporters um in the celebrity world. That's that's so great. And you mentioned that your efforts obviously had to change during COVID. Now that things are starting to open up, hopefully, although there might be a new mask mandate soon and we don't really know where we're heading with this new variant, but yeah. what do you see in the next couple of years? What are the main events or avenues or how do you expect to push this movement forward? Well, that's, You know, in the digital world and where we are in 2022, my hope and goal is that this new app, Cancer Buddy, is able to um, really help us as an organization and be incredibly impactful in the cancer world because it not only connects people to people, but it also is a, a great digital platform for hospitals to connect all their patients because you just put the filter in for, let's say, whatever hospital you're at, and other patients will come in there to that app. Um, Also, we, from that app, you can go directly to our website to learn all of our other programs and get patient navigators to help you. And so I'm hoping that we're, as an organization, we're gonna get much larger and have much more support because of this app is gonna be, you know, in our United States, but eventually I want to make it into different languages and have it globally. So I, I hope that this will, this digital platform will connect patients from all over the world with the rarest forms of cancer or with needing that support. And, um, and will also connect a very vulnerable population, which is the adolescents and young adults. And a lot of those young adults, you know, they're they're just getting started in life and then they get 
they get um, taken down by diagnosis of cancer and they might be in college or trying to get an education of some type and they now their friends are kind of going by the wayside and they are stuck you know in treatment and trying to go on with their lives and so cancer buddy this app will hopefully connect all those young adults that um, through universities and so forth, um, because we have a filter for university. So you could be at one university, but you could connect with another patient from another university. And then you can kind of help each other get through education while going through treatment or having chemo brain or whatever the case may be, and give a lot of support. So I'm hoping that this app is going to bring a lot of people together and provide tremendous amount of resources so somebody could get on the app and they could say, you know, they need financial assistance or they need to help get to another specialist and they can speak with one of our patient navigators or get information from their peers. And how many people are in your organization now? We have a very small team. Okay. Um, there's about 10 of us. Okay. And I feel like, you know, um, there's 10 of us. And then of course we have, you know, we have 30 psychotherapists that, you know, all, um, help us on our platform. So we and we have a huge medical advisory board of eighty doctors and nursing board and social work board. So we have we have a big team as a group, but just like the day to day administrative work and our work is you know conducted by a smaller team. And um, but I feel like we get a lot more done that way than if we had a lot of red tape and to get things approved you have to go jump through hoops. And so we don't have any of that and. I feel very fortunate that we don't have that. Absolutely. Now, to wrap things up, is there one piece of counterintuitive advice that you have followed or something that you believe that not many people believe? Um, I can't think of uh, just, again, you know, knowledge is, you know, our best, you know, a lot of people just want to bury their heads or, not know what's next for them when they get diagnosed with cancer. And I think that knowledge is, you know, the way to go. Sounds good. Well, I want to leave the rest of this to you to close out this episode. So the floor is yours. Promote what you want. Direct people to any action you want them to take. And you'll wrap up this hour. Well, my... Most exciting time right now is that I feel that this app, Cancer Buddy, is is incredible for patients um, around the country. And so my hope is that people will download the app and um, jump on it and meet their buddies and have their buddies give them the support that they need and make cancer a less lonely, lonely experience for everybody. That sounds good. And if you're listening, visit the website. It's bonemarrow.org, bonemarrow.org. And uh, I thank you very much, Christina, for taking the time to join me on the show today. Thank you so much, Ross. And with that, the official podcast is over. <laughs>